What if we could learn from outstanding leaders in business, sports, and education from some of the best voices in corporate America? Lighting the Path is a series of interviews with industry leaders whose stories highlight strategies that build purpose-driven cultures, engage and retain top talent, develop drivers that create high-performance teams, and connect people to the vision of your company. Join us to hear from game-changing, talented leaders whose paths make a difference at work and at home. Our guest today understands the meaning of leading from the jump seat better than almost anybody I've met. Peter Docker spent 25 years with the Royal Air Force and over 14 years helping companies on a global basis chart new courses and expand their leadership capabilities. He's authored this book called Leading from the Jump Seat, which is totally about as leaders were called on to turn control over to those individuals whose capabilities can take organization, help them to take flight in the new directions many times better than we could ourselves. So sit back and, and enjoy and be, be, be stimulated by, by Peter Docker author of Leading from the Jump Seat. Mm. And their job was to vet that out, to find out how do we take that amalgamation of information and come up with the, 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 to chart the right course. Mm. What's been your experience um, uh, from playing with you earlier, or whatever, you seem to be somebody who has uh, a strong belief and opinion of this is the right way to do things. Um, but I, I know I fall in that category too. The challenge I have when I have a group of people I'm working with Sometimes my belief that this is the right way to do things can overshadow the results yeah. that we're trying to do. Um, yeah. how, how, do, how have you personally managed that? Because you've got amazing experience. You've got amazing thought process. How do you dampen that down to allow room for other people to step up? Yeah. Um, well, I, <laughs> I think when we're looking at situations where we have come across it before, then uh, the it's being the the challenge or the the, the problem then um day to day you know we, we can have a system and process to address those sorts of of challenges and you know they're quickly sorted out because it it falls within our experience um there is a danger there that we never learn how things can be done better mm -hmm. and uh, many years ago i I did some work with this, this chap, um, Daryl, who actually was a, a voice coach um, and a personal coach. Uh, he worked with many famous actors, um, including Daniel Craig, I seem to remember, the, the uh, James Bond chap. Um, but he started life, he left school at the age of 14. You know, this, he, he had a few years on him, so this is going back a bit. And he started life sweeping the floor in a piano factory. And when he, on his first morning, he started sweeping that floor and one of the piano makers, he jumped up, he said, oh, stop, you're doing that wrong. I mean, what's wrong about sweeping a floor? You can't get that wrong, can you? But actually he took a step back and the piano technician showed him and he got a bucket of sawdust that he wet down with water and threw the wet sawdust down on the floor first. Because as he explained, when you then swept the floor, the damp sawdust stopped the dust rising up and settling on these beautiful grand pianos. And so Daryl always remembered that because it taught him that there may always be a better way of doing things. And you just need to have the humble confidence actually to give people the opportunity to, to figure it out. Or in your own case, you know, if you think you know how to do something, um, you can always ask others how they would go about it. Mm -hmm. So that's the danger there. But I think the skills that allow us to potentially learn a better way of doing something that we already feel we know about, those skills particularly kick in when we're facing the unknown. When we're in those situations where we don't know the answer, just like Gene Kranz with Apollo 13, because if we've developed the skills where we're willing to listen and learn, that equips us well to handle the situation of the unknown 
where we don't know the answer. And there's nothing worse, and I'm sure you've come across these folks, Mike, as have I, the senior person who really doesn't know what to do, but that doesn't stop them trying to tell you what to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very much so, and very much so. Everybody can see through it. So in that situation, what I find really useful to hold on to is, well, what are we trying to achieve here? What are our, what's the, the handrail I'm going to use? And that comes down to actually where the book starts. It comes down to having a clear understanding of what's really important to us. What's our stand or what are our stands in life? You know, mm-hmm. what drives us? And when we have a clear understanding of that, it then gives us the, the, the handrail that we need to be comfortable leading in the unknown and be comfortable allowing others to step up and help us figure out the, the solutions to the problems we're facing. Yeah, especially talking about stepping up. Right now, there's a, a huge um, challenge we're fighting globally because mm-hmm. of the pandemic. Uh, and it, the, the word you keep hear, hearing about is called disengagement. You know, mm-hmm. uh, monster.com just did a uh, uh, survey that showed that 90% of the people that they surveyed are open to considering making a job change. Yeah. You know, which is uh, frightening when you stop and you think about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you look at the role of a leader is to make sure that somebody stays engaged, um, a lot of times, um, and I think in most circumstances, is if a person feels that what they have to say has a sense of value, their role has a sense of value, yeah. um, that's where engagement comes into play. And so what I'm hearing you say as a leader, what we've got to do is sort of tamping ourselves that even if we know the answer, there's, there's huge value in, ask, in allowing me to ask you the question, letting you come up with the answer. And you know, that's a great answer and move on. Let you take credit for the answer as opposed to me puffed up and walk in with my cape. Uh, uh, we talked about absolutely. Earlier. And, and if I can just build on that a little bit, Mike, because I think it's really important. Um, often people in senior positions can be focused on why aren't they, meaning they're the people in it, why aren't they doing this or why aren't they responding uh, as I would hope? Um, and that's the time to look in the mirror because it's probably about you. Mm-hmm. you know? And I think one of the biggest challenges is when the people around you don't know what you stand for they don't know what's really important to you in life you know by really important uh, i'll give you an example you know a couple of years ago i had a phone call from my wife and she sounded rather shaky and she'd just been involved in a car accident thankfully she was okay but the car was a mess now i dropped everything and went straight to her there was nothing that would have got in my way whatever the difficulties nothing to go to her and that was because something that's really important to me, as is really important to many other people, is our family. Yeah? And when we have something that comes up that we feel the security of our family is threatened, it, it's, you can feel it inside. It's a powerful force, driving force. It comes from love, but it's a powerful force. So that's something that I would count as really important to me. But there are other things that are really important to me such as uh, the notion of um, not being a burden to anybody. This is just me, you know? Um, And again, I talk about this in the book, but that that drives me forward. Equally, something that's very important to me is the notion of mutual respect. And uh, again, in the early part of the book, I talk about how when that emerged for me as as something that was really important, it made me leave university mid-course and take another path, you know, because it was such a driving force. So when we start to get clear on what's really important to us as an individual, that allows us to make commitments based around that. And then people around us start to understand who we are, what we stand for, what's our character. And that then gives them the opportunity to either say, well, yeah, actually that fits with what I believe too, or not. And either is fine, but if they do, share the sort of beliefs that you have and want to be a part of that, then it's much easier for them to orientate themselves and find a way that they can step up to help you with whatever it is you're trying to solve or achieve. Yeah, that's the, the word that you wrap around that, at least I do, is the word is authenticity. The more that you can be around yourself yeah. and be willing to show that and be comfortable in that space. Uh, well, yeah, and sorry, I interrupt you there, Mike, because authenticity is something which i've 
struggled with, mm -hmm. and I'll explain why. It's something that we hear a lot of. Yes, that's why I said it's a budget. Yeah. Regime, isn't it? You know, it's it, 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 to be authentic. Um, and I always had a, a bit of a niggling doubt in my mind. That it, it, there's something about it that didn't feel complete. And then I, I heard Seth Godin speaking, a mm -hmm. um, uh, great author and uh, teacher. And Seth, he, he helped me out because what I heard him say was, look, we lose the right to be authentic by the time we're about four years old. You know, a four-year-old uh, child who's screaming because he's hungry or tired, well, that's authentic. But you know what? As we grow up, we need to find a filter. And that filter is integrity. And let me give you an example. When I was leading a couple hundred folks in the Iraq war in 2003, my authentic self would have perhaps shown that I was a bit fearful. I was uncertain what the heck we were doing. I was uncertain about the future and what the outcome was gonna be. But to have shared how I felt at the time to my people would not have been in service to them because they probably had those same feelings. What they needed from me as their leader was a degree of certainty, guidance, to give, to pull out a signal out of all the noise that was going on, to pull out a signal, something that they could hold on to. Yeah, and that's where integrity comes in, having the integrity that goes with the position or the rank or the responsibilities that you have and the way people are looking towards you for support you know so integrity for me is what we're after as leaders not authenticity necessarily because <laughs> that means that we just show sharing whatever we feel at the time and that's well, that, that, fits, yeah, that fits in really well with with the journey i've been on that uh, with the book that i have that just came out it's called emotional intelligence or equipped to lead yeah, you know, the extraordinary power of emotional intelligence. What I'm hearing you say fits right in the middle of that. It's our ability to do uh, self-awareness, which yeah. is my, one of my three buckets. And the second is self-management. Only when I do those, so then I can do relationship management. Yeah. Uh, under nice. dire circumstances, I have to, uh, and, you, and you write about this in your book. It's, it's the difference between uh, reaction and mm. response, what I call it, effective mm. re it's reaction versus effective response. Yeah. Uh, what you're describing is I've, I've been able to respond emotionally, effectively under those circumstances, situations. There's times that people need to see that I'm frustrated and angry, as opposed to early on, it said, uh, somebody says, Mike, I can't tell anything you're thinking. You have a deadpan face. So yeah, I, I think yeah, you're right. It, it's a balance. Um, reaction, response. Um, I talk about the, the, the sense of reaction often can come from fear. So let's say you're on, uh, you're a pilot of a, a passenger jet. If you have an engine fire, a big red light comes on and a very loud bell sounds. And I can tell you that even if you're in the simulator and kind of expecting it, it makes you jump, you know, your, your heart skips a beat. And it would be very easy for an untrained person to react. And that react would, reaction would come from fear. And so fear, what have we got? We've got uh, freeze, fight or flight, haven't we? The, the traditional fear reactions. Well, um, freezing and doing nothing is not really your role as a pilot. You gotta do something. Um, Fighting, well, there's nothing to fight physically. Flight, as in running away, the passengers would probably get a bit upset about that. And you run out the back of the plane, yeah, yeah. with a parachute on. You know, that's not good. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you have fear take control as your reaction, you're, you're stumped. You'd probably just freeze. And that's indeed what would happen to someone who was untrained in that situation when the, mm -hmm. the bell and the light um, uh, came on. Uh, so pilots are trained with what are called immediate actions. And immediate actions are a series of memorized actions that they will automatically take when an engine fire occurs. And these actions have been predetermined by pilots and aircraft engineers and technicians sat in a nice warm, cozy room on the ground with plenty of time and all the manuals around them, all the technical manuals. And you can figure out exactly what you need to do in the order you need to do them in. 
Pilots then memorize that and they practice it over and over again. So when it happens in a very, very rare occasion, it does happen, they can, instead of reacting with fear and freezing, they can put in a premeditated response, those immediate actions. And although it only takes a few seconds, what's really interesting, Mike, is that those actions fill in that time that normally you might be freezing or fear is taking hold. It gives you a little bit of thinking time to then respond better with what are called subsequent actions and figure out what you need to do next. So reaction and response are, um, well, the, the, they're very important to recognize what you're, how you're, um, uh, how you're approaching uh, a situation. Yeah. Um, because sometimes our reaction of anger or lashing out is not what you need. Um, we need a response if we need to. If we yeah, want especially to because I, I'm glad you brought anger up because you have fears, um, a, a negative emotion. Uh, anger um, is a sometimes negative emotion sometimes sometimes it's a positive response and the fact that anger you know can actually rally the troops it can raise the bar it can kick into this but what happens is if it's used in extreme it becomes mm -hmm. destructive and it's being able to, to to be able to manage that that effective response yeah. that you're doing in a way to be able to get the productive output you're looking for yeah, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I'm 100% with you on anger being useful, because for me, anger is, is you're a bit out of control. I, I tell another story in the book, which was part of my development, I, I guess, when I was a, a young, what's called a, a flight commander in the, the Air Force, a, a major equivalent in the US um, forces. And I, I'd taken some guys and aircraft off on a deployment. And the first morning, my senior technicians, the guys who ran the aircraft maintainers, engineers, they did not report for duty. They'd been out on the, the town the night before and they'd failed to report. And this was appalling because there were a group of people looking to them for leadership. But I had to address this. Now, I could have got angry about it. I would have been in my rights to get angry. But instead, I thought about it, I reflected on the situation. I brought those guys in eventually, um, checked their side of the story, but then without anger, very quietly, I told them how they'd let themselves down, they'd let me down, and they'd let the team down. And these two guys, I remember, you know, they were considerably older than me, which seemed to play a part <laughs> in the way I thought. They were, they were actually shaking, I remember, in front of me. What they couldn't see is, because I was behind the desk, I was shaking too underneath that desk, because I thought, how the heck can I deal with these guys? Plus the fact I had to continue to work with them for the, the, the days and uh, a week or so that followed. So, you know, I, I still wanted to make sure they were productive. But the way I dealt with them seemed to work well because I couldn't have wished for two more dedicated guys afterwards in that deployment. And actually, in the couple of years that followed, if I ever needed to deploy somewhere, I needed uh, an engineering team leader. I would look to one of those guys. You know? So uh, anger is an interesting one. Yeah. Um, in my experience, whenever I've got angry, I, I haven't achieved the outcome that I was kind of hoping for. Yeah, I, I had to go back to like yourself. I had to go back and rethink this because I'm very much like you. It's I'm um, my role as a leader is always bring peace. I want connectivity. I want harmony. Uh, yeah. I was in talking to a, a couple of my clients who are wired differently than I am, that they're hard chargers. We had this discussion and they were the ones who kind of said, Mike, you know, you need to look at this. Sometimes they need to see a fuse so that you can create. Um, focus on the competition you get something there the, the, there's a way of being able to use anger that raises the bar raises somebody's willing to do more to go to extremes to push themselves more the problem is is that whenever anger the example you, that you're giving it becomes volatile becomes attacking mm -hmm. it turns into yeah. a negative force that doesn't bring bring connection and bring things together so and um, i i would agree with that you know again taking an extreme of human um, experience for me, the Iraq war, 
we were flying at the time large um, aircraft, 737 sized, um, carrying fuel because our role was to air refuel, give away fuel whilst airborne to fighter jets. And we're completely unarmed, um, undefended, and um, the uh, opposing side would shoot at us from the ground, which, you know, was a bit discouraging. But, <laughs> but you know, it's very uh, understated. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, using your example of the, the anger, we could have, I could have tried to harness anger um, uh, and uh, to get the guys to go in the aircraft, you know, put themselves in harm's way because, well, we've got to, you know, take on the opposition or whatever. But you know what? I, can't, I haven't found anybody who can stay angry for days on end. It's mm. exhausting. What I chose to do, um, more by luck than judgment, to be honest, Mike, was I gathered all my people around um, before the, the, the first day of combat operations. And I, I said, look, I said to the aircraft maintainers, your role is to keep these 40 year old airplanes flying in serviceable so as the air crew, the pilots can do their, their job. I then turned to the air crew, I said, your job is to fly every mission that we're given and refuel every fighter jet that comes up for gas. Because unless we do that, those fighter jets are not gonna be able to give air support to our troops on the ground. And if our troops on the ground, American, British and Australian, don't get that air support, they're gonna die. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Now. That meant that each and every one of those guys um, and girls on my team, they had their focus. It came from the love side, not fear. And I didn't have to order anybody to do anything. They were so focused, they put themselves in harm's way time and time again. And we were tasked with 479 missions during the four odd months. We flew 479 missions. And everybody who went out with me came back home safe. So, you know, if we're talking about anger versus something sourced from, from love being in service of somebody else, for me, the latter wins every time. And if you want results, then the statistics I've just given you are pretty good results in my mind. So Very much so. What, what I love about your book is it's not a concept, it's really practical how to. Um, learning objectives that somebody if they're willing to look at the read the book and and have any kind of self-reflection mm. uh grow and develop out of it so i, I peter i want to thank you for for your, your time and sharing and uh, the journey um, the uh, is there I'll, I'll put this in the show notes but if somebody wants to reach out to you what's the best way for them to get in contact with you well you can find me on all the usual social media channels um also the the website which as I speak, Mike, is just about to be updated, but leadingfromthejumpseat.com. Leading from the jump seat, name of the book. Um, there's lots of resources on there. And uh, also you can contact me um, whether you want help or, you know, I, I, I speak around the world, but also I, I uh, work with companies to help them bring leading, to the jump, uh, leading from the jump seat to life. So uh, yeah, be happy to hear from anybody. Super. Well, great. Well, thanks so much for your, your time and your interest and best wishes on this book. It needs to be on every, every leader's desk as a, as, a, uh, as, as a tool for them to use to be able to uh, continue to grow and evolve in the way God created them to be. Lovely. Thank you so much, Mike. And yes, the book is available from the 26th of this month, 26th of October in the States, um, uh, all the usual places. So thank you very much indeed for your time today, Mike. Super. It's been a joy speaking with you. Same here. Thanks for joining us today on Lighting the Path, Strategies for Tomorrow's Leaders. If anything in this podcast speaks to you, if I've challenged you, or if you want to spend time digging into this subject a little deeper, or if you disagree with me, reach out. My contact information is on our website, lightingthepath.net, or email me at mike at mikelejeune.com. Also, look for me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect our networks. Keep lighting the path for those who choose to follow you. It's more than a responsibility. It's an honor.